Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Everybody, my name is Stor. I am an alcoholic. Um, I first want to thank you guys for having me tonight. Um, before I came into Alcoholics Anonymous, I don't know about anybody else, but when I was out there, the one thing I did hear was, you're not welcome and please don't come back. I mean, that's where my drinking and drugging took me. So to be invited to come, you know, to Pennsylvania uh, is quite an honor, and I consider anything in uh, Alcoholics Anonymous when I'm asked is, a, is an honor. Um, Jeff, thank you so much for asking me. And uh, my road dog, Maria, who's one of my group members, uh, thank you for taking the ride down with me. Um, I do have a sobriety date, and it's February 3rd of 2008, and I am certainly not a first-time winner in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, it took me a little while, and uh, it took a lot of pain, not only for me, but for people around me, uh, for me to get here. I do have a home group, and uh, it's called A Vision for You. We meet in North Quincy, Massachusetts on Tuesday night for a one-hour speaker meeting. Uh, we have a five-minute meditation in the beginning. And the most comfortable chairs in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, let me tell you, it's, it's a beautiful thing when you're sitting for an hour and there's no AC, and in the winter time there's no heat, and uh, and you know you you have to get comfortable in those chairs to, to, to do a good job. And the five minute meditation actually is a beautiful thing. And I do have a sponsor. My sponsor has a sponsor, and I do have a working knowledge of the twelve steps of recovery out of the Big Book of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's all I have is my experience. And that's it. And uh, since I am a little bit of a big book guy, um, and the big book tells me that I should disclose to you in somewhat of a general way what I used to be like, what happened, and what my life is like today. I, first of all, I want to recognize the people, though, that raised their hands and, and you know, knew or just coming back. That's awesome, because when I came back, I couldn't do that. I didn't want you to know that I was new or that I was just coming back. And that takes a lot of, that takes a lot, you know, that, that, that takes some walking through some fear to do that. And uh, for a guy like me, I didn't have that. So I was saying to Maria, I said, you know, my main job tonight is really kind of disclose for me what Alcoholics Anonymous is and what it's maybe not. Um, Because there's a lot of ideas and a lot of opinions about maybe what Alcoholics Anonymous is and what it's not. And I have some, but I'm not going to share with you my opinions. I'm going to share with you what my experience is. Um, I grew up in an awesome family uh, in the southern part of Virginia. Much like driving down this road out here, um, and I, when I pulled up in this parking lot, my grandparents had a farm, and I was telling Jeff and David dinner tonight that, um, and Steve that um, uh, my brother and I spent a summer, I have an older brother, and we spent a summer pulling tobacco, and that's probably the nastiest job I think I've ever done. For I, like eight years old pulling tobacco, and for three years I had tobacco stains, and I didn't smoke. And, you know, it just looked weird. <laughs> and, um, and you know, I, you know, I'm kind of a, I kind of grew up in that. Um, upper middle class family, but my dad taught us what the meaning of a dollar was and, and the importance of that. I didn't really care. And I hadn't picked up a drink yet, but I didn't care. I, what I cared about was what you could do for me. And, um, and I didn't know that at the time. It took many, many years later to kind of figure out, you know, why I thought that. And it's because I'm selfish and self-centered. That is the root of all my problems today. And I uh, thank God for 12 steps of alcohol times because now I know what to do with that stuff. And um, growing up, I uh, I was that kid, um, you know, and I grew up in the early 70s, so I'm going to date myself here. And um, and my life was unmanageable from the, from the day I was born, and I can say that honestly and clearly today. Um, and the reason why is I grew up in the deep, in the South, um, and I won't say deep South. I actually went to college in Alabama, which is to me the deep South. And... Uh, I went to Auburn University, so I always brag about that because we're national college champions this year. And I grew up, um, and I, when I was in first grade, I had to sit with the, with the teacher's aide in the classroom while the rest of the kids went into the cafeteria. I'm that guy that's allergic to peanuts. And fatally, I mean, like, uh, anaphylactic shock. I've been in oxygen tents, um, you know, brought back to life practically when I was nine years old. Like bad, I mean, obviously badly. And it's gotten worse, they say, since I've gotten older, which I don't, I haven't tested the waters with that. And what's weird is that I haven't tested the waters to see, am I still allergic to peanuts? But I'll test to see if I'm still allergic to alcohol. <laughs> and I would burn my life to the ground every time. It's just, it's amazing, you know, what we'll do, you know, for that type of stuff. And I, um, my life was unmanageable, but it had nothing to do with the way I was being raised. 
I was raised with morals and values, principles, uh, what it was to be a good person. And um, and because I was allergic to peanuts, I was separated from my fellows. I mean, I had nothing to do with anything but there was God-given circumstances. Now, we often say in Alcoholics Anonymous that our experience is to show someone else, to, you know, to be a benefit to them. I'm not sure what that is going to be a benefit for yet. I haven't seen it. But I, I can tell you that, um, you know, at an early age, my brother and I uh, were both very involved in sports. Um, we played three to four sports a year apiece. Um, very active in our youth groups, our church, um, school. You know, we were pretty bright kids. And um, I remember, like, just being uncomfortable kind of restless. And uh, I was also allergic to everything else. So I was on a ton of medications in and out of the hospital and out of to see Durham, North Carolina, to Duke University to see a, uh, an allergy specialist for many years. And uh, allergy shots, you name it. I mean, I was just kind of that guy that was different, and it really wasn't me trying to be different. It was just, it is what it is. And um, I remember my parents had a back deck, and uh, at nighttime, some neighbors or friends of theirs would come over, and I noticed they were pouring stuff from bottles into glasses. And and I, you know, they were, you know, kind of that family that um, staunch conservative, you know, let's. There's a big pink elephant in the room, but let's not. Let's pretend like it's just not there. And uh, but as soon as they got a couple of drinks in them, well, let's talk about anything. And uh, I never remember watching them one night. And I remember thinking, wow, that's kind of cool. I want to kind of act like that. But I need that, what they're having, in order to act like that. That's I made correlations between that stuff. So I went up, and I, grew, I was eight years old, nine years old. I reached for my mom's glass. She smacked my hand. She said, son, with all the allergies you have, you should probably never drink alcohol because you're probably allergic to that as well. And and we don't come from an al- I don't come from an alcoholic background whatsoever. I will say that my mom's twin sister died 25 years sober, and that was a pink, big pink elephant in the room. I didn't know when until she died of cancer, and I didn't know until about a year before she died that she was an alcoholic. And she told me, and I was like, Are you really? And I remember the reason why I came up in conversation, I was in college, and uh, I used to drink 7-7 seven and seven for football games. And, um, and my aunt said, that's what I used to drink. And this is after she told me she was an alcoholic. I never touched, even in my worst days out there, I never touched 7 and 7 again. And I thought if I didn't drink that, I won't be an alcoholic. I won't be like her. Um, I, you know, I didn't do a whole lot of drinking growing up, you know, as a kid. Um, I watched what my brother did. I was an observer. And uh, I saw what he did, and I knew what not to do. Or I knew what to do and how not to get caught. And... um so I kind of, my parents always thought, that's a good kid. He's the good kid. He's not going to get into trouble. And, uh, you know, I went off to college, and I was eight hours away from my hometown um, where my family couldn't get to me. And I started drinking, you know, with a vengeance. And school came easy to me. I could memorize information, and I could put it back down on paper. Much like how I used to read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, which I read alone, and I was memorizing the information, and I could put it back down on paper. But that big book, I don't know about anybody else's experience, it needs to get from my head to my heart. Because I need to be that big book. I need to relate to that experience. And, and that wasn't happening for me for a lot of years. When I was, uh, and I don't tell this story that often, but I, I, I do in certain situations, and tonight just kind of came to my head to tell it. Um, because I, it does not make, I will say this, I will absolutely preface this, I, this does not make me alcoholic whatsoever. I was 21 years old. I was at, uh, I was graduating from Auburn University in Alabama. I was engaged to a woman. And, um, and, I, and I, I had everything going for me on the outside, and I was miserable on the inside. And I knew one thing in my life at that point that would change. You know, if I if I uttered those words, and um, I came from a staunch conservative Christian background, Southern Baptist family, and um, and I knew that as soon as I admitted this, my life would change and my family's life would change, and their view of me would change as well. And uh, at the age of 21, I couldn't live the lie anymore, and I knew I was gay, and uh, I had to end that relationship. I had to live a double life. I had 
straight friends here and gay friends there, and I had to keep all the madness going in my head about who to tell what to and who not to tell this to and what to do and what not. It was just insanity. I mean, absolutely insanity. And, um, you know, I came from the background of, you know, my mom said, the Bible says you're going to hell. And I, and I had a belief in God at that point. I didn't have a relationship in God. I had a belief in it. And I remember thinking, all right, God, you made me like this, so you must already have predetermined that I'm going to hell, so I'm going to party out like a rock star. And I shoved God, and I was 21 years old, and I'm 41 now. I shoved God to the side, and I said, let's go. And uh, I found people that drank and drunk like I did. Um, at dinner tonight, we were, we were talking about how did I end up in Boston? I was living in North Carolina, and this was over about 15 years ago. And um, I, I needed to get out of the South. I needed a geographical cure. I did not know that's what I was doing. And how that happened was my dad um, was my best friend who got me out of trouble all the time. And um, he had a leukemia and had a bone marrow transplant. And he was at the Medical College of Virginia. And I, uh, he wanted us to ch- take him back to church, so we did. He shook hands with someone one morning. It was the day after Christmas. And um, he immediately got sick, because anybody that knows about a bone marrow transplant, he had no immune system. He shook hands with someone that had a cold. We had to take him back uh, to the Medical College of Virginia. And um, before that, he was showing up in court with me in a wheelchair with a shaved head of the chemo and radiation and a mask on because he couldn't breathe around other people, begging the judge, who happened to be his golf partner, to not send his son to jail. And I'm looking at him going, get out. Why are you here? Like, are you serious? Just get out, Dad. So um, they wanted to give my dad, they wanted to give him uh, relief within his lungs because he had a lung infection called aspergillus. And they were going to put him into a drug-induced coma. And um, they were putting... um, a respirator in. They said, now this is going to work for about 48 to 72 hours. You know, we're going to pump him full of antibiotics, rest his lungs, let the respirator breathe for him, and we'll bring him out. And this this will do well. Great. So my mom sent my brother and I in the room and said, um, don't say goodbye. Just say, Dad, we'll see you in a couple of days. And that's what we did. And my dad didn't look at my look at me or my mom or my brother and say, I love you to any of us. But he did look at me and he said, don't get into trouble. And um, his eyes closed right after he said that, and he was to never awake again, and he died 24 hours later. It doesn't pain me to say that. It actually, for a weird reason, um, gives me a lot of joy and hope, because I know today that my dad is sitting here right with me. I know that. And it might sound corny to some people, like, how do you know? You just know. And I, I saw my dad help a lot of people. He was an alcoholic. He was like a Haley Joel Osment from Pay It Forward. He was that guy. He would give you his last dime to help you. And, um, and I know that this is what my dad would want me to do today, not to speak, but to try and help and be a good person. And, and I, that's why I continue to do what I do. It's kind of in his honor. And it keeps me sober as well, as I'm sure many of you know. <clears throat> I, um, within a couple of months, I was sitting with some friends in North Carolina. We decided the South wasn't working anymore. So we needed to move. We literally were doing shots of Jägermeister. We had put up a, um, we were in a bar. We had gone to the dartboard. We had gotten a road map from the convenience store next door, put it on the dartboard through darts. One hit Boston. And three weeks later, there we were. <laughs> Been there ever since. And um, it's, it's kind of funny. I think God really had a plan for that uh, without my own permission. And um, it's amazing when we move somewhere, we go somewhere. We found people, I found people within minutes that were just like me. Like, it, it was, it's uncanny. I found the relationship that I thought I wanted. Um, the house, uh, you know, in the south end of Boston, you know, the big home, the, the, the what I thought, you know, on the outside looked like the perfect relationship, which was not. I, and I always say that, you know, I was telling Marie on the way here, I loved that house, not the relationship, but I loved the house because the house represented something to me. And um, and this is where my alcoholism took me. I, uh, I, I'm i not going to get into drugs because I respect the hall that I'm in, but I will tell you that a lot of non-approved AA substances came in. And um, there was one in particular. 
and I was hanging around with a group of guys that were kind of doing this one particular substance, and um, I did it nine times, literally, and did not get the desired effect that they got. The tenth time took like a charm, like the insanity. You know, how many times am I going to continue to do this? And uh, it wasn't long. It was about six months after that happened that I literally became homeless, and I lived on the streets for 18 months. And um, before that, I had gone home to see my mom, and in kind of a gray out, um, she said, I'm not your dad. Your dad died trying to help you, and I will not do the same. I know you're getting into trouble because moms always know. I'm all set with you. Get on the next plane and be gone. And I was horrified. Are you serious? Are you serious? Thank God she did that. But there was a lot more pain left to come. And um, when I ended up homeless, I had no family. And uh, people in Boston, like me, if I saw someone like that, better you than me, kid. You know, good luck to you. There's a shelter down the street. Go ahead. And I saw people going into shelters, but I was better than that. <laughs> they had a roof over their head. I didn't. And I, literally, for 18 months, I lived on the streets. And... um I was going in and out of detox for a long time. And uh, I, you know, started going to halfway houses. I started to become a little bit more institutionalized. You know, I was getting arrested. I was hanging out with people that um, I that had no business hanging out with me. You know, I don't know if I had any business hanging out with them or not, but I, they certainly had no business hanging out with me. And uh, I um, got involved, you know, with the halfway house. I My first halfway house, I was scared to death. I was an angry, jaded, cynical gay man. Like, I was going to cut you up and spit you out. I was going to make sure that I pounced on you first so you didn't hurt my feelings first. And, and you know, I built up that wall. You were, you know, we're different. We're not the same. You know, I, you know, you don't know me. You don't know anything about me. You don't know about my life. And, and the truth of the matter is I wasn't going to tell you the truth. So how was I expected to get help? You know, the thing about help is if, if, if somebody raises their hand and says they need help, that's great. But then you have to be willing to receive help. You can ask for help all day long. You, you might say, I'm not getting the help I need because you're not willing to receive it, maybe. Maybe that's the case. That was the case with this alcoholic, through and through. I was a 90-day wonder in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was a six-month wonder. I even got up to a year at one point. And it was like holding my breath, shooting for midnight, hanging on to my seat, and I was hanging around these halls, and I was waiting for that miracle to happen because that's what I was told. And I'm going to tell you, I, that stuff used to make me so mad. And, and I had a huge resentment against those people that were telling me that on the fellowship. But what I've learned today is they were given to me what they had. This is what worked for them. So I'm not here to step on what other people do. If you're happy and sober and you're living that life that you want to live, if it ain't broke, don't fix. But if you're struggling and you're suffering and you're brand new or you've been around for a minute and you're still suffering... Ask for help, but be willing to receive the help when asked. I um, Every time I picked up, I would get the job, the relationship, and the apartment back. That stuff came back like that, just easy. And and then I'd stop. You know, oh, I got what I got, got what I need, good. Thank you, thank you guys, good, I'm good, see you later. And, uh, and then I'd end up homeless again. The car, the job, the apartment. I wouldn't lose it. I'd give it away. Like, I, you know, the, here comes the dealer. Here you go. Here comes the bartender. Here you go. You know, I'm giving that stuff because I, I need what I need. And um, February of 08, um, I, I, I was sitting with a friend of mine, and our uh, bartender came over. And, um, and the guy looked at me, and I'll never forget what he said. He just looked at me square in the eye, and he goes, kid, you've got a problem. So when your drug dealer's telling you you have a problem, then you know you're scraping the bottom. Like, you know that that's just bad all the way around. And um, and I was homeless yet again. Um, a friend of mine had just given me their couch for like a week. So he's like, get your life together and, you know, we'll get you a job. And are you serious? I mean, I don't know about anybody else, but if I'm getting, if I'm drinking and drugging, I'm not going to work. Like, that's just not, that's not happening. You know, and that was a six month wonder at work. I'm pretty, you know, like I said, a pretty decent college educated guy, but I couldn't show up for work because I was a big bedevilment on page 52. You know, I was, I couldn't be, I was unemployable. I was uninterviewable. Like, I mean, I couldn't show up for interviews. It was horrible. 
And, um, and I, you know, I was a good manipulator because I could talk my way out of anything and talk my way into anything. But that day, in February of 08, um, I left that house with nowhere to go. I went, once again had a duffel bag that had about three shirts, two pairs of pants, and a sweater. And everything else was gone. And I, I, I will tell you from the bottom of my heart, I did not want to come back to Alcohol Snobs. Because I didn't want to hang on to my seat any longer. I couldn't hang on. I just couldn't. And um, a friend of mine, I went to detox, and a friend of mine said, you can come stay with me in Quincy. You can have my couch. But the deal is you got to stay sober. All right. So on, uh, I'll never forget, it was February 15th of 2008. Um, I was 12 days sober, and I called my drug dealer. I'm good. I'm ready to come back. But I gotta go to this meeting first, okay? I meet you, knowing that I'm gonna end up homeless again. Knowing that that was a, a deal that I had set, that I had agreed to. And that night, you know, a friend of mine says, God whispers, sometimes he yells. And that night I think God drop kicks me in the back of the head, and, and, and what happened was a kid came to the podium, um, cause I had told my friend that I was staying with, that I'd go to this meeting with her, but I was meeting a, a buddy of mine back in the city, so, she's like, oh that's cool, just remember you need to stay sober. She knew I was gonna go get high. And um, that night, uh, a kid came up to the podium, and I don't remember everything that he said, but I remember that he looked happy, and he looked sober. And I remember him talking a language that I had never heard before in Alcoholics Anonymous. I never heard someone talk about the freedom and that you can get well. Uh, seriously, you can get well? I told I, I had people tell me I was going to be sick the rest of my life. What do you mean you can get well? Because being that little kid... From the time he was born, that had been sick his entire life with allergies. I did not want to be continue to be sick for the rest of my life. You know, it just seemed like a death sentence to this guy. And um, for whatever reason, that night I stepped over. Because usually I'm sitting in the corner making fun of people's sneakers and their shirts and whatever else. Look at her. She's high. Look at him. What's up with that? You know, I'm that guy. And, you know, and I'm that guy. I'm not that guy anymore. Thank you, God. But that night I remember, you know, I stepped over my friends. And I shook this kid's hand. And I said, I need help. Because he said, if there's one guy in this room that needs help, one guy, one guy, one guy, come talk to me. I went and talked to him. And the next night, he took me to his home group, which is Dorchester Saturday night. And um, he talked about, you know, I heard another speaker that night that talked the language I certainly didn't understand. But it, it hit me like right here. And the thing was, with a guy like me, you know, when we talk about what, you know, I've heard people talk about what hope is. And for a long time, I couldn't identify hope. I knew what hopeless was, though. I could identify with the opposite. I could identify with what hopeless was like. Because when I'm sleeping out at Logan Airport in the air train terminal and taking a shower in the air train terminal to try and go get my hustle on that later that day, I remember looking in the mirror thinking, I'm this, there's, there's, there's nothing looking back at me. There's something that's just not right. So this kid, I call him a kid because he's in his 20s and I'm certainly not, um, picked me up and uh, the next day he, you know, took me over to his house. And we sat in his, uh, his little, like, office area. And at that point, he had three pit bulls. And now he's got, like, five or six. And um, with those three pit bulls sitting by the door. And he's, every time I move, the one named SJP started growling. Like, I'm like, all right, so I'm not getting out. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> so, go ahead and tell me what you got to tell me. <laughs> you know, and, um, and I walked out of there. With a little pep in my stuff, as he said, he watched me go down the driveway, and my a friend of mine picked me up. And I, at the first time, I could identify what hope was. And I didn't ask for hope. I was just willing enough to listen to something. I was scared of the dogs as well. And I was just willing enough to hear something. And um, and what he did was quickly, and I say quickly, um, and it doesn't matter how long it takes you. It doesn't matter what way you do them. If you're not involved in the 12 steps, get involved. And what this kid did was he walked me quickly through those 12 steps of alcohol and arms. Now, I had been involved through AWOLs and through 12 and 12s and Big Book Step Study in previous sobriety. Um, and I say sobriety because I believe what I have to now is recovery. And it's because I'm not simply sober sitting in the seat. I'm actually taking action on a daily basis because I've been shown what it is to take action. I don't make this stuff up. So this kid um, walked me through those 12 steps. And... You know, it was interesting because I did exactly what the big book said I, said I would do. It's, as he's telling me, like in We Agnostics, and he's telling me, like explaining his experience. And I'm like, yeah, because I'm identifying with this kid. Yeah, yeah. 
And then there's God. No, uh-uh. No, 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 no. I'll send Dude, did you not hear I was gay? Then you know what the Bible says, right? He's like, you know what, Stuart? He's like, do you believe that you are the great you are? Because let me explain something to you. If you think you're the great you are and you're homeless, the rest of us are pretty screwed. <laughs> Got a point. And I remember thinking, um, he said, you know, so the whole point of this book, as it says in step two, is to enable you to find a power greater than yourself that will solve your problem. And I was like, why has that never been pointed out before? And he goes, you, how many times have you read this big book? I'm like a half a dozen. He goes, then you read it a half a dozen times. He said, but we're just, we want to pull out the highlights and talk about what this action is that we need to take. And uh, he made me a lot of promises and he made me some guarantees and I didn't believe them. And I told him every step of the way, through those 12 steps, this won't work. This won't work. And he finally looked at me and he said, I don't really care if you think this works or not. If you take the desired action, you'll get an undeniable result. He said, Stuart, these 12 steps are like principles. And a principle is constantly in motion. It's like gravity. Constantly. So if I'm sitting out here, and I'm not inside those 12 steps, I'm not doing anything. But if I jump in without my own permission, I'm going to lie right along with that. I might get banged up a couple of times, especially in the ninth step. I might get banged up a little bit. And that's okay. But I'm going to keep going. I'm going to keep revolving with that. It's like the Earth's axis. It's constantly moving. And it doesn't matter whether we believe it or not, it's still going to move. It doesn't care what we think. And those principles don't care what we think. All it cares is that we do it. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous for me is not a, a program for people that want it or even need it. It's for those that do it. It's a doing man and woman's program. If I'm sitting in a bar stool and I'm taking action by ordering a drink and pouring it down my throat, I took physical action. The guy next to me is not getting drunk watching me do that. But I am. Because I took action. The same thing happens for me in these 12 steps. One and two become more ideas and experience. Three through 12, there is physical action all the way through that. There's something physical I have to do. Whether if it's kneeling down and asking God. Whether if I'm writing a fourth step. Whether if I'm reading my fourth step, which is my fifth step to my sponsor. Whether if I'm asking God to remove my shortcomings and then humbly asking to, to take away my character defects. Whether if I'm writing a list out of people that I've harmed or going out to amend that past. Or whether if I'm taking a 10-step inventory on a daily basis. And in 11, I'm trying to improve my conscious contact by prayer and meditation. And in 12, having had that awakening, trying to go out to others, to the other men and women that may need help. And I'm certainly not always the right guy to work with someone, but I'm certainly the guy that will sit down and listen to whatever you want to talk about. If I'm not the right guy, it certainly will point you in the right direction. Because I am not the great I am. And thank you, God, for that today. I was... um. Uh, this, I, I don't have to apologize. And Maria's poor, poor thing. She's heard the story a thousand times. When I got to my eight step list, and uh, I was 45 days sober at that point, I had moved. I had gotten a job making $10 an hour. And uh, I moved from there, from the couch to a sober house. And um, I literally, I'm going to tell you what the fellowship did. And I, I don't talk about the fellowship enough, but. My life was so simple that it came down to whether if I was going to eat that week or if I could pay rent. And I was not going to end up homeless sober. So the people in the fellowship showed up anonymously on my front step with bags of groceries to feed me. And I used to cry all the time. And I'm like, but why? And they're like, because you're doing the footwork. You're, you're, you're doing something. And um, and the fellowship saved my life in that regards because I didn't want to end up homeless and sober. I just didn't. So when I was 45 days sober and I got into that eight-step list and my sponsor had me writ- write it in a certain way. He's a clever little guy. And um, when we got to that eight-step list, he said, who's number one on that list that you've become willing to make amends to? Because, you know, in the eight-step it says we've become willing. I didn't think I was willing I certainly in my own mind would have said I wasn't. And I said, um, because he had me write it out so that I was dealing with the family first. And um, at that point, it had been eight years. I can still remember it like it was yesterday. I can still remember it as if it's happening right now in this moment. And um, it had been eight years since my mom said, better off than you and me, kid. you got to go. I'm all set. I'm not going to die like your dad did. And my spot, I said, well, it's my mom. He said, find out where she is. We need to go see her. Are you smoking crack? 
Are you serious? I was like, Sean, it's been eight years. He goes, I don't care if it's been 28 years. You said you were willing to do anything. And this is anything. I said, I don't know where she lives. He said, God will help you find her if you ask. And at this point, I still wasn't believing in God. And I have three very clear stories I'm going to tell you about about how God has worked in my life. To the point of where my sponsor says, if you don't believe in God, nobody will ever believe in God because of the God shots. I mean, very clear, like kicks that I've gotten that are just undeniable. And um, this is the first one. And uh, so God, I asked God for help to try to find my mom, and, and God provided. And uh, thank God for Facebook, right? And, uh, <laughs> and uh, she's not on Facebook. Um, but a friend of her family says, and I didn't go into a lot of detail, but I just said I need to speak to her. And um, to this day, I've never heard from that person again. But I can tell you that she gave that number to my mom because my mom did call. And, uh, and I was ecstatic. I couldn't believe it. My perception. I'm her son. Of course she loves me. But my perception was just distorted. And uh, so we had made a plan. Um, I had asked to come see her, and she said, why? I said, I'd like to try and, and amend what I've done in the past. I'll have to think about that. And I, what, what I did find out is that she lives in uh, Hilton Head Island, South Carolina. And what a beautiful place that's to go to make amends. <laughs> Couldn't have asked for a better one. And, uh, and that's what we did. She called me three hours later and said, you can come, but you cannot stay here. Okay. She had checks and credit cards that she just didn't want to make sure they stayed in her possession and not in mine. Because <laughs> that was my M.O. And, uh, and I don't blame her. And I knew at that point that's okay. And God works in her life in a funny way because she, what I found out is that for eight years she sat in front of the TV and watched the Weather Channel and wondered where her son was. And she prayed every single night that God would keep me safe. Her prayers were answered as well. The interesting part is that before, two weeks before my sponsor and I went down there, and, and, and this is what I call, it's my opinion, I call it good sponsorship or God-directed sponsorship. And why I call it that is because my sponsor and I are nothing alike. And I tell it all the time. He's 28 years old. I'm 41. He's straight. I'm gay. He's married. I'm single. He's got five pit bulls. I'm all set. <laughs> like, there's just nothing. There's nothing about us that are remotely the same. Now, here's this kid who got in his car, because I don't have a license or a car, and I'm only making $10 an hour at that point in time. And he took time out of his wife, his life, his job, and his dog, which, by the way, he loves his dog more than anything. And he got in the car, and he drove me 38 hours for one day. And what happened... Um, Two weeks prior to me going there, my mom had befriended a couple that lives beside them. They had just moved in. And they went out to play golf like everybody does in Hilton Head. And I got gotten home, and my mom had offered the man um, and his wife beer, wine, liquor, whatever. And the gentleman said, um, no, but thanks. You know, if you have water, I take that. I just don't drink. My mom said, I've never met a golfer that didn't drink. And for whatever reason, because he said he, he, I've met the man since, several times. He had said that he'd never told anybody this before, like out that he just met. He goes, well, I've been sober for 40 years. My mom said, can I talk to you? She took him outside, and she explained how long I had been sober and what we were about to do. And she said, the, she said the man cried. She said, that's Alcoholics Anonymous. All this other stuff may not be, but that's Alcoholics Anonymous in action. He said, I would like to meet your son and your son's sponsor. So we get down there and we think, we drove for two days. All right, it's 19 hours one way, 19 hours back. And uh, when we got down there, I wanted that ticker tape parade. Here I am. And my mom's like, here you are. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, what that gentleman had done for her was explain to her to be ready and to think about what she would like for me to do. Because when I'm making amends, I'm not telling her I'm sorry. I'm amending what I've done in the past. And I'm also offering my services. How can I be of service to you, Mom? She had a list. <laughs> my sponsor looked at me and he goes, that's awesome. <laughs> He's like, now you know what to live up to, kid. And absolutely. And um, 
I did not have a white light experience, but I think as close as what I could have to relate to it. Um, Saturday, June 14, 2008, at 11.42 a.m. The amends were made on Friday, Friday the 13th. And um, Sean, my sponsor, sitting on the love seat. I'm sitting on the couch on this end. She's sitting on the couch on that end. Big empty space in between us. And she's asking a lot of questions about Alcoholics Anonymous. And I'm deferring to him a lot because I'm like six. I'm, at that point, I'm four months sober. What do I know? You know, I, I have my experience. I don't know that much about these principles. I, I'm learning. I'm working with others at this point as well. And, and they're teaching me. And um, it's not that I don't think she's ever said this before. But it hit me that morning. And what hit me more was that it hit my sponsor. And what happened was she reached over that empty cushion and she grabbed my hands and she said, I just want to tell you how proud I am of you. And I remember I looked at my sponsor who's like, usually like has a dip cup in his hand like (laughs) doing that. And I'm I'm looking over at him and he's like this. And I, I remember saying to him, I'm like, what just happened? He goes, I don't know, Stuart. He said, but what I do know is that the air in this room lifted. And I can tell you that that empty seat God, right there. He touched her heart and my heart at the same time. I could not even tell you today why I was ever resentful over the woman when all she tried to do was help me. And that moment changed every fiber of every bit of my life. I cannot, in a million years, put it into words. My sponsor says it all the time. He's like, I watched... It was like watching Com. It's like it's Comcast can't. You can't buy that on Comcast. Like that was life. And the cool thing is that I've been able to go back year after year for her birthday and Mother's Day, which run together, and um and be of service. And I watch her just smile and how happy she is. And my stepfather, who told me when I was down there, he goes. I am happy that your mom's happy that you're here. He goes, but I want to tell you something. And he said, I I hope this will change one day. He said, but I need to be honest with you. He goes, I hate you. (laughs) Okay. He said, your mom has been in distress for eight years, but she did what she had to do. And um, not long ago, he called me and we were talking about something. He goes, I don't care what anybody says to her. He goes, I'm your biggest fan. And it's not because you've done anything for me. It's because of what you've done for your mother. That's awesome. And it didn't take much but just a little bit of action and a lot of willingness. The action's not that difficult. It's the willingness that will get us every time, at least with me. Um, I was 63 days sober, and uh, my sponsor told me to go help somebody because we had just read uh, Chapter 7, Working with Others. And I told him, are you kidding, kid? I'm making $10 an hour. I need to go and get a real job because this temp job that I got is getting ready to run out. And I'm, I can't end up homeless. And he said, you got it all wrong, Stuart. When you go and you mess with your own life and you try and straighten it out, you screw it up every time. He said, you help another one of God's kids and you let God take care of all your stuff. All right, Kev. Day 64, a young woman that I had seen in alcohol time, she'd been sober for about seven years at that point, was suffering. And she said, can you help me? And I went to my sponsor, what do I do? And he goes, help her. <laughs> And um, and, and I sat down with her and I explained my experience out of the big book to the best of my knowledge. And um, day 88, and I know this because there was a little chart that was kept, and uh, and I and and the one young woman's name is Cassandra, and um, she had made reference that in 25 days we were doing her fifth step, and um, she was picking me up at work, um, actually not at work, she at the tea station, and we're going back to her house to do the fifth step. And uh, that temp job I had was for 90 days. And that day, the woman, I'd asked the human resources, I loved that company, and I'd asked the director of human resources if they wouldn't mind writing write me a recommendation. And I was honest with them that I had to leave early on Thursdays because I had a house meeting with my sober house. And she said, well, why do you have to leave early on Thursdays? I said, because I'm sober. And I live in a sober house. And I remember thinking, oh, what did I just do? And she said, close door, let's talk about that. And she was, you know, she loved hearing about what I had to say. And um, so day 88, I wanted to stay with this company, but they did not have a job to offer me. That was okay. 
I had to believe at that point that God really was going to take care of me or something out there was going to take care of me. I didn't know what it was. And, um, cause Sandra was going to pick me up at 5.30 and at 3.30 the director of human resources said, shut your computer down, come on, come on back to the office. Well, that's it. And I remember saying, oh, my sponsor was wrong. And, um, I, I sat down in the human resources office and she slid across the middle of the envelope and she said, um, here you go. And I said, thank you. And I said, it was my recommendation. I said, I really appreciate that. And I appreciate the terms. No, 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 no. Sit down. Open that up. When I opened it up, it was a job offer for a job that they created for me with benefits and health insurance and all this stuff that I had lacked for all these years. And I was blown away. I said, but why? She said, because you're consistently trying to help people, even here at work. And I was like, I am? Like, I didn't know I was doing that. I had no idea. And um, I went, and the reason, the funny thing is, I was doing Cassandra's fifth step two hours after that. The first fifth step I had ever heard. And what an incredible experience that was. I don't know if it was for her. It was for me. You know, because here's someone that's trusting me with information about their life. I have not stopped. I'm too scared to stop. I'm afraid if I stop, then I'm thinking about a drink again. And I don't want to think about a drink. I obsessed about a drink and a drug every day for all those years prior that I was sober. And God had so, so saw fit to re- remove that from me. The second God story that I have, I was a uh, wonderful world of Facebook, once again. Um, I was uh, asked to go by a friend that I used to drink and drug with in uh, Richmond, Virginia. I was asked to go and speak at a meeting uh, called the Roundhouse in Alcoholics Anonymous. The meeting's been there, I think, now 69 years running straight. It's like the third or fourth longest running meeting in Alcoholics Anonymous. And what an honor. I was like blown away. Are you kidding me? And uh, when we showed up, I had a lot of wreckage to clean up in Richmond. So my sponsor was like, well, two birds with one stone. Let's go take care of business. So I did. I was able to go. And I love because I found freedom so much. I didn't find freedom in a fifth step. That was just my experience. My freedom came from going out and repairing the wreckage of the past. And um, my sponsor and I, you know, cleaned up some wreckage. And the morning that we showed up at the roundhouse, it was in November of uh, 2009, and we were standing outside, and uh, it's all glass, it's octagonal, all glass all the way around. And I stood on the steps that morning, and normally when I have a jacket on, I wear an angel heart pendant that my best friend Teresa gave me. And, um, and I said that was my dad close to my heart. Corny, yeah, but it works for me. And... Um, as I stood on the steps that morning, I looked up, and I said, oh, my God. And Sean's like, what? And I said, that building. And he goes, what's that building? I said, that's the Medical College of Virginia. That's where my dad died. And it just didn't ring with me as we're getting down there, that this is where I was going to be. That morning, as the story I just told you a few minutes ago about how my dad died, I had never told anybody before. It was on my amends list. It was on my fourth step list, too. And that morning, I started. I told that story. I told what that angel heart pendant meant. I told how my dad died, because I could see from the podium looking out the door. At the end of the meeting, um, some people were coming up and shaking my hand, and my sponsor standing off to, to my left-hand side. And, and this gentleman, had, you know, if you're speaking, you sometimes you're trying to connect with people in the audience. And this older gentleman was kind of leaning up, like looking. At the end, I saw him in line, and I shook his hand, and he said, um, my, and I, as I normally do, I introduce myself by first and last name. I don't believe in keeping myself anonymous in these halls. I don't think that's just for me. You know, people do whatever they need to do. And uh, that my dad's name was Robert. And people that knew him well called him Bob. And those that knew him really well to, to call him and say, let's go play golf or lunch or whatever, called him Bobby. And the showman came up to me and he said, um, I want to tell you that I knew Bobby Coleman. And my sponsor looked over and he goes, are you kidding me? And I'm like, you know, at that point, I have tears coming out the sides of my cheeks. And um, I asked the gentleman what his name was. He said, you don't need to know my name. He said, but what you do need to know is I know your dad struggled with you for years and years and years. He said, I can tell you that your dad's here with you today. He said, your dad would be so proud of what you're doing. From that moment to this day, right now at 854, on August the 1st, that man has never been seen again. We don't know his name. He was never seen at that meeting before. 
and he's never been seen again. I've checked, trust me. I've gone back to Richmond several times, and I've gone to that meeting looking for him. It's incredible what one human being can do for another. I've told that story every single time since. That man, God sent to me. I do believe that God sent me that man. And I'm going to kind of wrap this up with a a story that happened this past May. When you lose your family and you lose your loved ones, um, we have the power to break our families apart. That's what happens. We have that power by our actions and what we're doing. But I did not have the power to pull my family back together. And I have an older brother I haven't seen in 15 years. And I go back to Hilton Head, like I said, every May. And um, I had tried to make contact with him, and he told my mom, I I don't want to talk to him. I don't. And it broke my mom's heart to tell me. It literally did. And I I, I hugged her, and I said, this was a year ago. I said, Mom, it's all right. On God's time, this will happen. It will happen. I do believe that. God's time came this past May. And he showed up on Mother's Day with his wife, who I'd never met before. And um, I, he had said to me, we'd had a conversation once prior to that. And he said, you know, I don't want to talk about Pastor. I, I've asked some questions about Alcoholics Anonymous. I know kind of what this stuff's about. I don't want to talk about that. He goes, I'm glad you're doing well. Okay. So on um, Mother's Day, when he showed up, we had a little quiet time, and I just said, you know, Rob, his name's Rob, and I said, Rob, I just want to be your brother, and whatever that entails, just let me know. And um, I, I knew that going into that, that these amends that needed to be made with him or to the best way that I could were not about me. They were not about him. We're all that my mom has. We're it. And what happened um, was after we took my mom to church and out to brunch and we're all sitting on the beach, my mom leaned quietly up, put her hands on both her boy's shoulders and shook us like this. And she said, this is the best Mother's Day I've ever had. We both pulled our sunglasses down. (laughs) And I looked up and I said, thanks, God, because I know without a shadow of a doubt that you're in my heart because I can carry you wherever I go. I don't have to worry about going into old neighborhoods or worry about going into places maybe that I used to go that I'm too afraid of. I don't have to live with that fear anymore. Fear to me means false evidence that appears real. And it's exactly what it is. It's false evidence. As long as I carry God in my heart, and I do on a daily basis, I don't have to worry about what anybody else says or thinks. Because God is the one that's keeping me sober. God has seen fit to put the most incredible men and women in my life. I call them a cast of characters. They have taught me more about me because I don't have answers. But if I'm searching for an answer, I'm having a newcomer come up to me. And I've worked with a lot of women. I, because I'm gay, I end up working with a lot of women. And um, my sponsor told me that. And I was like, oh, really? And, uh, and I, I'll tell you, I love you. I absolutely love you women because you've taught me more about me and, and relationships. And, um, you know, I want to leave you with this. When we talk about what a spiritual awakening is and what it means, you know, I don't know what that means. I know what it means to have a spiritual awakening on drugs and alcohol. Get that. I'm waking up. But I did not know what it meant, you know, to be a sober man, a man in recovery, and have had, having had that spiritual awakening. Because I didn't feel that. What I've learned is that I have the same eyes, and I see differently today. I have the same ears. And I hear differently. I have the same tongue, and thank you, God, I speak differently. I have the same mind, and thank you, God, I can think differently. But most importantly, and without a shadow of a doubt, one of my meetings, there's a sign that says, God is love, and for an alcoholic of a hopeless variety, which is what I come from, reverse that, love is God. Without one, the other doesn't exist. I did not know how to love. And that's what, to me, this program has taught me, is how to love unconditionally. And without that, you know, thank you, God, that I have the same heart, and I not only know how to love, but I know how to love differently. Guys, thank you so much for having me tonight.
Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.